Okay. So it is uh, ten fifteen, uh, and we and it's time to um, to start this this session. This session uh, is a um, is is an invited session, and is an invited talk of Professor Michael Goldstein. Um, and uh, I will um, I will I will briefly introduce uh, uh, Michael. Um, uh, I was supposed to, uh, to make this presentation in French, but definitely I will make it in English, so if Michael <laughs> wants to correct me. <laughs> well, uh, uh, Michael Goldstein is professor in the Department of Mathematical Science at the University of Durham, and uh, his research interests cover both uh, foundation and application of Bayesian uh, st uh, statistics. Uh, he provided a major con contribution to Bayesian uh, an, an analysis uh, with, by the developing the bias linear methods. And there is also a very nice book uh, that he wrote uh, about this topic. And as far as applications are concerned, uh, let us remind, among many others, uh, some works on software uh, reliability or prediction and decision making for large scale physical systems. And more recently, uh, he focused on uh, uncertainty analysis of complex computer model and he is one of the main contributors to the MUSM project. Uh, MUSM is the acronym for Managing Uncertainty uh, of, co of Complex Model. Well, the MUSM project is, is currently turning into a community and so that will be the future of this, uh, of this initiative. Uh, what, what can I say more? He's a member of the ISBA, International Society for Bayesian An An Analysis, and is the author of uh, uh, more than 100 papers. And I'm very, very pleased to welcome Michael to the uh, Journey of the Statistics of Toulouse. Thank you. Okay, fine, fine. okay thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I will give my talk in English. Better that way, believe me. Okay. So my subject is the Bayesian uncertainty analysis for complex physical systems modeled by computer simulators. It's a very big area. I am going to just lightly touch on many things. Each one of them, if you're interested, is something to think about, possibly to follow up. Okay. So most large complex systems are nowadays studied by mathematical models. The models are implemented as computer simulators. Here's a good quote to set us up. This is from the manager of the Oxford Supercomputing uh, Center. Wherever possible, everything's done in a supercomputer. Look at Formula One, gets rid of all its wind tunnels, replaces them with supercomputers. The same in the aerospace industry. You do all the modeling in the supercomputer and do just one real world test. Okay? So climate is like that. We have a lot of climate models. We're going to do one real-world test. We're going to keep putting CO2 in the atmosphere, and we're going to find out what happens. Okay? So you have a model, you have the real world, and uh, okay. so the obvious point is that here we are modeling away. So to use a complex simulator to tell you about the real world raises many, many questions. Okay? And the questions are practical. What do we think climate's going to be like? And they're also foundational. Why do we think our methods work? What do we think they mean? And I'll touch on both of these. Okay? So let me give some, I'll give three examples. Okay? So firstly, think of an oil reservoir. People who manage oil reservoirs, they build simulators for the reservoir. That simulator directs them in uh, how to, to manage this, the reservoir. People who model the universe, they build galaxy simulators, which model how galaxies form from the Big Bang up to now to try to understand how our universe is. Climate change, I've already referred to. Most of what we understand about long-term climate change is based on the analysis of complicated models. Okay? Oil reservoirs, galaxies, climate change, they are all very, very, very different. Okay? And if you have a big application, it is different from that. The uncertainties in each one of these applications and in your application will all be the same. You will all have the following. Firstly, there are parameters to specify. If I run a, uh, 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 an oil reservoir simulator, I need to describe the geology of the reservoir. 
which I don't know. There's condition uncertainty. There's many drivers of the model which are uh, on top of that. To understand the galaxy model, the driver for that is the location and intensity of dark matter at every point in space and time. Now, uh, we don't know that clearly. It's a source of uncertainty. Okay? There's functional uncertainty. These models, for example, climate models, take a long time to run. A climate model takes weeks or even months to run on a supercomputer. We do not know the function. The stochastic uncertainty, the models usually have, there are certain things that the equations don't determine, so there's a, a, an uncertainty involved there. The solution uncertainty, you write down equations, you cannot solve them exactly. Even if we got the parameters, the conditions, the function, the stochastic uncertainty, and solution uncertainty, the model is just a model, so there is a structural uncertainty. We match it to measurements. The measurements have their own world of uncertainty. We understand that. We have not got just one model for climate. Every country has its own model, multi-model uncertainty. And then there's decision uncertainty. We want to help control the things that we're modeling. The relationship between what we can do and what happens in the model is also uncertain. All of these sources of uncertainty for every model okay, and, uh, uh, need to be analyzed. So, where are we on this? Well, uh, we had a uh, mention that of the Muckham project, managing uncertainty in complex models. If you uh, just remember the four letters M-U-C-M, and you Google that afterwards, you'll go to a website with many, many interesting things to say about that. And we're part of that, and it's a, a, a great place. However, it is very rare. I wrote down nine uncertainties. I, it is very rare for a single one of those uncertainties to be properly analyzed. Okay? Nine uncertainties, very little analysis. Okay? Now, for something like climate, if we have not analyzed these uncertainties, the notion that we can do sane policy for avoiding catastrophe okay, without an understanding of uncertainty is clearly wrong. There is a gap between modeling and the real world that uh, is very rarely actually addressed. So why is this happening? Basically, because modelers don't think about total uncertainty. Sadly, nor do most of our community, m m most statisticians do not think about total uncertainty. So policymakers don't realize, in fact, they don't like uncertainty, so they're very happy not to be confronted with this. It is very hard to get funding for uncertainty modeling because the, uh, the, the, the funding all goes to the modeling, to the data collection, and etc. And it's hard. So it's not surprising that, that there is a big gap. Okay? So that gap can be filled, and that is one of the reasons I like to go around giving talks, to help people think, oh, yes, there is a gap. It's a very big gap, but we could fill it. Okay? So oil reservoirs, the universe, uh, climate, they're all very different, but there's a formal structure that sits underneath them which is the same, which is why I can do an analysis of one, and I can move the formal analysis to the others. It's very easy to say. Effectively, each simulator is a function. It takes inputs which represent the behavior of the system, which represent the properties of the system. So X will be the uh, a description of the reservoir. It gives outputs which are the behavior of the system. Okay? And so that would be what happens at the wells, what happens in climate, uh, what happens like in, in, in the universe. Okay? So we're in, when we build a model, we like to learn qualitatively. But we also want to learn about X. We want to learn about the reservoir. We want to learn how informative the function is for what will happen in the world, how informative is a climate model for climate. And if we have historical observations, for example, historical climate observations, how useful are they to constrain? And if we have decision in outputs, we, we model it to help improve the world in some way. So in a climate model, we would have historical values, we would have future values, a model would tell us things like if we keep increasing CO2 at this rate, what impact will it have on temperature? What will be the knock-on effects? Okay. So how do we solve these problems? Let's solve them on one slide. Okay. So we have uh, 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 
Uh, let, so we'll do the easy version first. We have a perfect model and we can observe things without error. Okay? Then we have uh, there's a subset of the things that the model outputs which correspond exactly to things that we see. We write down this equation that says that z that we see equals the function at x star, the, 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 the true value. We invert that. That tells us what x star is. We run it forward and we choose uh, our d to optimize the properties of y. Let's immediately point out that that would be extremely hard. Very clever people spend their entire lives inverting much, much simpler functions than climate functions, universe functions, or reservoir functions. And they invert really fast, easy to sort of manipulate functions. So even the inversion in the simplest case is a very challenging problem. And of course, it's not so easy. What we observe, we observe with error. The model that we have is not the same as the system. The simplest thing we could do is to write down two equations that make some different. There's our observations being not the same as the system. And there's uh, uh, what happens out of the model, the fx star, not being quite the same as uh, what really happens in the world. Okay? And my plus notation means that the two bits are independent. So we now have to carry out a statistical inversion and optimization. And let's just say the obvious. If it was hard to invert once, <coughs> it's much harder to invert uh, 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 statistically. If for no other reason than you have to do the inversion for a whole bunch of different ranges of z, and, and uh, it's obvious how it, it's much harder, isn't it? And there's, when I wrote down those nine uncertainties, most of them are still uncounted for, the multi-model uncertainty, the condition uncertainty, they're still not there. So, oh, so I thought, okay, I'm now going to talk through, effectively, given how hard it is, what I think is a sensible thing to do. Before I even start, I want to say a bit about what the analysis means, okay? So I just wrote down, and people just said, fine, okay, these two equations, these two simple equations that y, the thing in the world, is my model at best value plus error. What I see in the world is uh, what's really happening plus error. Okay? So these are a collection of uncertainty statements. All this week, and when you go back, and everybody in the papers, they talk about uncertainty. So let us be clear what this means. Because we're going to talk about climate uncertainty. We're going to tell everybody in the world to completely change their behavior. What because we're going to do an uncertainty analysis, what is this uncertainty? Okay. So there we go. So what do the uncertainty statements mean? Whenever you make statements, you should always be clear what they mean. Okay. So we talk casually about, say, the probability of uh, a global disaster. Pro what, does that, what does it mean? Okay. Let me be more specific. Here's a quote from the BBC website. Okay. Fortunately, rapid climate change is one area that UK has taken the lead in researching by funding the Rapid Climate Change Programme, the aim of which is to determine the probability of rapid climate change occurring. So what does that mean? It seems fine until you think about it. I don't know what that means. We could have a discussion for an hour. We could have a discussion for a day. We could go out into the streets. We could go into the scientific community and just ask, what do people mean by that? And we would get many different answers, most of which were, well, given that people don't even know what climate is, no two climate scientists would agree what climate was, Okay. Given that the effect of climate change depends so much on what we do and is an interaction between people and processes, you know, the notion that there is the probability of rapid climate change, what, I don't know what that means. I don't think anybody who uses the term knows what that <coughs> means. That is not just loose like media speak. We don't expect the media to be precise, but they got that probably from this. So Rapid Watch is an NERC, which is a government, a, a UK sort of funding agency sponsored program. So this is, uh, Rapid Watch is an observing system which observes the, uh, the, the, the overturning of the ocean. Okay? And one of the main drivers of rapid climate change could be that the Gulf Stream could shut down, so heat would no longer be transported. Okay? So this looks at recent observations to estimating risk, blah, blah, blah. The project must do a lot of stuff. Now, I am the statistician on this project. There's loads of climate scientists. There's one statistician, well, there's me and one postdoc. Okay, so we have to do this. We have to, there is the, pro the probability of rapid change. 
Okay? And we have to make sound statistical inferences about the real climate system. Okay? Now, I'm a statistician, here, so what do I have to therefore do? Okay? So what, does, what do these words mean? I don't know what they mean, and I can guarantee you that the people who wrote this didn't know what that meant, because I, I know them, I talk to them. They said, well, obviously you should make, well, why would we make unsound statistical statements about real climate? You know? But if you ask them, can you show me one example of a sound statistical inference about real climate? Of course they can't. They don't even know what it would mean to make a sound statistical inference about the real climate system, given that we don't even agree what the real climate system is, and we don't agree what any of this is. Okay? So now this is clearly, a, 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 we could take a long time about this. Let me cut to my chair part of the chase. I'm a subjectivist Bayesian, and the reason I am basically is because I understand what that means. So a subjective Bayesian, okay, so any probability statement is an uncertainty judgment of a person. Okay? And we measure it on probability scale, and there's a big theory of why we can. Okay? So the particular point about this is that uh, a probability statement it is a probability of a statement of a person. I would be still a bit confused, but I would be less confused if we talked about and probability of rapid climate change. I still would want to know what rapid climate change was, but I'd know what probability meant, or Bob's. Okay? So that makes sense. My probability, your probability, your probability. Okay. Now, of course, in the world, people would find that puzzling. Okay? They want to know what scientists talk about the probability. So scientists would say, well, the public would say, well, why do we want to know your probability? We want to know the probability. Okay? But actually, they're disappointed about the wrong thing, because probability statements made by scientists, they don't reflect anyone's probability. There is nobody who would assert these probabilities. Is. There is no climate change probability statement anywhere you can see where anybody would own up to it. Okay? So it's just a thing that came out of an analysis. You did the model, it gave a number, and that, that's, that's the answer. Okay? So what I would hope that we would achieve as scientists, firstly, when you have a probability statement, somebody should assert it, who is expert enough for that to be of value. Secondly, they should show you the reasons why they asserted it. Thirdly, because it is a scientific community, you should look at the various other conclusions that it would be reasonable to reach. Now, once we mean by probability that, now we have something that is meaningful and that we can all, all talk about. Okay? A large subject, I hope, you know, if somebody has a different reason, meaning for probability, we can talk about that. Okay? So now, okay, given this, we're going to talk about Bayesian uncertainty analysis for complex models. Okay? So we need to think about our prior distribution for uh, the inputs. We need to describe our uncertainty about the computer function. We need a discrepancy measure that links the, the, the model to the world. And then we need a likelihood function for the data. When we have all these things, in principle, we now have a nice framework that links everything up so that we can... Uh, Use the computer evaluations, historical data, expert judgments, scientific knowledge to determine values for so the inputs. For example, for the oil reservoir, we can learn about the geology. Assess future behavior of the system, what will happen to climate in the future if we do various things, and optimize it to the extent that we have any control. Okay. I have one more point to make, I think. Okay. So how are we going to do this? I said we do this as a Bayesian way, but we have a choice. Okay? Now, we can turn this into a problem which is very carefully specified with many, many sort of probabilities, very high dimensional probabilities, and then do an MCMC calculation. That's the full Bayes analysis, complete joint specification of all quantities. Okay? Now, if we can do that, if, it's, if we have a meaningful way of doing it, we can solve the computations. Well, that's brilliant. For high dimensional problems, that is really, really hard. We have an alternative. So it was mentioned that I wrote a book on Bayes <coughs> linear analysis. Bayes linear statistics just focuses on expectations, variances, and covariances. Probabilities if we need them, they're expectations of indicators. Higher moments if we need them, they're just expectations. But we take those as primitive. Okay? So as we say, probability is the most common choice. But there are many advantages as the problem gets harder in working with expectations. The specification is easier. There's much less to put in. If I'm justifying it, it's less to justify. The computations are much, much, much faster. I don't do MCMC. I do much, much faster things. 
And surprisingly and interestingly, this is again a big topic, the foundations, in my view, for subjectivist uh, probabilistic reasoning actually are expectation reasoning. And if we were to talk about foundations, I would argue with you that it's the expectation analysis which is the right thing and probability inherits a bit of that foundation. Okay? So I should just show you these equations. You won't see them again. Just like Bayesian theory goes on one equation, Bayes' theorem, then in, in, because I'm thinking about expectations and variances, I need an equation to update my expectations just based on expectations, variances, and covariances, and, an, expect and, 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 and a, uh, an equation to update my variances. You'll have seen these. These will be very familiar. They're like Krieging equations or multivariate normal equations. If you, look, if you stare into them more deeply, you'll see that Bayes' theorem is a special case of this. Okay. Bayes' theorem is a special case. This is not an approximation to a Bayes' analysis. It is a generalization of it. And in the foundational explanation, we would, we would talk about why that is the appropriate thing. But as it is, you can just imagine that we do a simple Bayes, sort of linear fitting. We look at the best linear fits, and we choose appropriate things, and uh, we, we get the sort of updated variances. I'm going to show you, well, either two or three examples, depending how I do time. But each one of them, in fact, worked on a Bayes linear calculation. To, I think it was fine. If I had done it probabilistically, there is probably a way you could do this. It would be much harder. One more point I need to make before I get into examples. Okay, we talked about expensive functions. We cannot run the function as many times as we like. So what we therefore accept is that we have uncertainty about the function. So uh, uh, what we therefore need to do is we need to build a probabilistic or an uncertainty model for the function at every choice of parameters at which we do not run it. Okay? This thing, uh, so we're, we're treating f the function as uncertain. It's a deterministic function, but it's still uncertain to us. We don't know what it is uh, unless we do a complicated, expensive experiment of running it for any particular input. Okay. Such a representation is often called an emulator. People who get involved in computer experiments spend a lot of time building emulators. So an emulator is both a meta-model, it's an approximation to the model, and, but it's an approximation that knows how good it is. Okay. So at any point, at any possible choice of parameters, it will give you, what, you know, an expectation and a variance, or even more if you're fully probabilistic. So you can, you can use the, the meta-model, but you can also you, 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 you can take account of the extra error that you've introduced. Okay, so the emulator either gives us a full joint probabilistic distribution or <coughs> means and variances. Okay. So what does an emulator look like? If you've ever done response surface modeling, you've, you may well have built these things. Okay. So here's a particular output of my simulator. For example, global mean temperature in 100 years' time. That's what fi of x is. x is the parameters that go into the model. I want to know how, as I change the x's, I change what the computer will say about global mean temperature in 100 years' time. I break it into two parts, two uh, independent parts. So the first part is my global variation. Effectively, it's a smooth surface. For example, it's a regression surface. It might be a series of polynomials in some of the things. It might be polynomials in transformed versions of these things. These functions could even be... Sometimes they're even more complicated than that. But the point is, it, we have a smooth deterministic function which we can compute very quickly. Now, because f is a continuous function and uh, the, the, the b times g of x is continuous. The difference is a continuous function, so we need to model a continuous, slowly varying function, which has like strong local correlation and gets much less correlation as we, we move away. So we model this as a stochastic process. For, uh, in full probability world, it would be a Gaussian process. In my world, it's just a second order stationary process. So we want the notion for the residual that two points that are close together have a high correlation, far apart they have a small correlation. So we, we need to specify the variance of the function and the correlation function. And there's an example, a familiar looking one. Okay. So how would we fit such a thing? Well now we're in our world, if we can do many runs, okay, if it's a cheap function, Okay. We can then, uh, we have you know, all our tools, we ju it's, we're just model fitting, so we use sort of Bayes, we use general sort of maximum likelihood, least squares, you know, whatever we'd like to do, with a lot of expert guidance to show us what, what we should be fitting. 
So therefore, there's a whole interesting subject about experimental design. How do we, what we choose our runs of the computer in order so that we can have an informative sample to fit on? And it's complicated because we don't want to just fit one output, we want to fit many outputs. And that's what gives it its uh, particular flavor. And then we fit the model, we hold a few of them, some of them back, we do diagnostic checking to see that everything's okay. That's if we have a fast model. Supposing we have a slow model, then the key part of the analysis is do using linked emulators. Okay? So if it's slow to evaluate, for example, a reservoir model takes a long time, we would coarsen it, we would create a coarse version which is qualitatively similar, which we could run many times. We emulate the fast and we use that as a prior to make a small number of runs on the full and we snap it in together. So there's our fast simulator. We build an emulator for that. Okay. We have many runs. Okay. So that's our prior emulator for the, uh, uh, the full. So uh, what we therefore do is we say, well, each of the coefficients in our fast is a prior for, for, for the full. We do various runs. We match them up. And you can see that, we can, that once we know that we have an informed prior, then we can produce a small number of runs of the slow and we can create a good emulator. Okay? And it's based on the heuristic that, it, that, that the hard part of emulation is choosing the form. Tying down the numbers is, is not so hard. Okay. Right, so I can now go on to an example. Okay, my first of, of my, my three. Okay, so I, I am in the RAPID project and we may not know exactly what the words mean, but it is a great project. Okay? So we're assessing exactly the risk of, uh, of MOC shutdown and how it responds to uh, the extra CO2 we're putting into the atmosphere. Okay. Now, our resource is that the last generation of climate models had CM3 is now fast enough that it could run in about six months on uh, a, a, a home computer. So we use something called climateprediction.net, which is a distributed computing system which anybody can sign up to, you can sign up to it, you can go back, go home, look at climateprediction.net and it will ask you, do you want to sign your computer up? And if you say yes, they will send you a copy of HADCM3, it will run in the background, it will, you can then choose parameter choices to run it on, and then when you're not doing anything else, <coughs> your computer will be running this, it will run, 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 and a few months later it will send back the answer. So each computer puts in a bit, so together <coughs> we have many thousands of runs for the first time ever of a serious climate model. It's a very interesting project. Now, <coughs> we're in the middle of analysing these runs. You can imagine there's masses of data, but I'm going to pick up something from right at the beginning. So we work with the Met Office, the UK climate people, and they were not sure whether to be in or not because we told them we were going to emulate. They, they said we would like to see an example of an emulation. Okay. So they wanted us to emulate their model directly, and we, could, we were allowed about 24 runs of the simulator. Not very many. We were allowed access to uh, a, a lower resolution version of this called Famous, okay. and they had some runs lying about okay, in, in a bucket somewhere. Okay. And the runs were for six different scenarios for CO2, CO2, we say we're going to ramp it up by 1% and we're going to carry on straight. We're going to ramp it up 2% for 50 years, then bring it down. That's a scenario. Okay. Then we had about 40 to 80 runs on each on, on, uh, on six scenarios. Okay. So using that as background to create our prior, we were then going to build our emulator. So let me just describe how we did that. Okay. So let me just say the design. We have the uh, uh, six scenarios. So we did some runs that matched parameter choices uh, in the model and uh, in, in, on HADCM3 with parameter choices in famous, same parameter choices in famous, so we could match how different it was when you ran on the two different simulators. Okay? We're just having varying one cloud parameter and one ocean parameter and the solar constant and CO2. Okay? And then we, we constructed a, a, a 16 runs, not very many, on uh, the rest of, of HADCM3. And there we are varying the parameters. So what we're interested in is 170 years of the AMOC, the Atlantic Meridional <coughs> Overturning Circulation. That's the, the, the turn, and that's the thing if it stops, that stops carrying heat. <coughs> 
So we're not, so the series is very spiky. We're not interested in the spikes. We're interested in the general shape on where it reaches a minimum, whether it sort of turns around again if you slow down the CO2, if you, how fast it goes down if you push up CO2, whether it comes back if you slow down the CO2. Okay. So these are our scenarios. There you see things called light up 4% and down. So after the time it carries on, it goes up 4%, and then after 50 years it comes down again. Okay. Or it doesn't. Okay, so these are the things. Here are some runs of the famous, coloured by the CO2 scenario. They're different because they had different CO2s. They also had different parameter <laughs> values. Okay. So we're interested not in the jagged thing, but in the smooth. So we fit splines to these things. So here's us fitting a spline. So the spline is, is uh, uh, well, it's a, it's a series of splines. So we have to, so the BJTs are the basis functions. We choose coefficients to, to do the smoothing. Okay, so there we see a smooth version of a curve. And there we see a whole bunch of smooth versions. So we emulate the time series by emulating the coefficients of the smoother. Okay, so, okay, so there, there. There go. So there was our, our, our smoother. We emulate the CJs. Because mm -hmm. as you change parameters, you change the coefficients. Okay. So you emulate the, 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 the time series, the smooth version by emulating the coefficients. And you do it, we did it separately for each CO2 scenario. Each one of them is different. Okay. Then we do our diagnostics, is where you take one of the points out, and you use our whole method to build up your, your, your simulator, and then you see, is it a fantasy? You, you, you put in the one that you left out and see whether it's within your uncertainty bounds. And there you see examples of, yes, there are uncertainty bounds, and there's our functions, thankfully, sitting nicely in between. We now need to link our emulator for the six scenarios to uh, what happens in... Uh, uh, had CM3, not just for the scenarios, but for every CO2 value. So there's two steps. We have to extend the famous emulator over the whole space. And that's a whole bunch of tricks. There's a whole bunch of nice geometric tricks that we can use. And uh, there's a reference at the end for the, 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 you really have to do this geometrically. So we push variance matrices around geometrically. We do a lot of tricks to extend our famous emulator to the whole space. And then we relate famous to had CM3, basically by the way I talked about using linked emulators. Okay? And then, so we create our prior, and then we take our runs to, to link everything up, and diagnostic checking and tuning. Thankfully it worked. The Met Office needed to see this, and they were happy with what we showed them. So here's had CM3 diagnostics. We leave out one of the points that's actually a computer run, and we, we create our uncertainty bounds, and we check that we, it li lies inside. And again, you can see it lying inside. The reds are what the emulator was. The blue was what really happened. And there, that seems OK. And here's us emulating at different parts of the space for which we have no runs. <coughs> Right, so let me move quickly on to another example. So this is a whole universe, okay, which is uh, my favorite example ever. So we work with the cosmologists at the Institute for Computational Cosmology. So they model galaxy formation and, uh, in the presence of dark matter. Okay? So it, before we even start, a dark matter simulation is performed on a volume of 1.63 billion light years each way. Okay. So that's a big simulation. That happened on a big computer somewhere else, and that we get given that. Okay. Well, we, the cosmologists, do. Okay. Then Galform puts light matter on top of dark matter, and it, run, it models the evolution of about a million galaxies. It just sends them forward. It starts at the Big Bang, uses it, the physics it thinks is right, and it runs the universe forward. So they've chosen 17 key variables to vary. It takes about a day for one run on one processor. And there's lots of output. Okay? The idea is that we now take the output from our model, we compare it to what we see in the universe, and are we matching or not. If we're not matching, that suggests there's some problem with our physics. If we are matching, that's telling us a bit about sort of what it allows us to quantify certain physical constants. So the question is, are there any choices of input parameters that match? And then are there many? So here's a quick picture. So that's the dark matter simulation. It's entirely made up, of course. It's a simulation. What you're seeing here is the intensity of dark matter in uh, a few billion uh, light years of space. And then you see light matter on top of it. 
Okay? Now, the, one of the main reasons we need dark matter is that when you look at light matter, it's, if you imagine it just the Big Bang happening and matter flying around, it's much more compacted than you would expect just by the gravitational attraction of the light matter that we see. There's no reason that things should be so close as they are. If you imagine that there's a much heavier dark matter behind it, the dark matter has already combined, and because the dark matter has extra gravitational force, it's pulled the light matter to it where the dark matter is sort of the most concentrated, and that would explain, perhaps, why we see light matter in that configuration. So that's one of the reasons, and one of the things we're testing, is whether that's enough of a, 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 a rationale for why light matter is compacted the way we see it. Okay? Here are the variables they're varying. They're things like how much metal is there in the universe, what happens when you get really, things get really close to the center of a black hole and then they're thrown out again, how much is thrown out, how much is absorbed, mind-blowing things like that. So there's a bunch of data sets. So they first asked us, the things that were most important to match are these luminosity functions, which is the, the density of young galaxies and the density of old galaxies. So we were given 11 values which were, well, we chose 11 values which were representative of, of, of luminosity, and uh, we decided our aim was to match them. <coughs> so let me quickly say something about matching. Okay. Now, people, statisticians are used to the model, those parameters. Let's do a Bayesian calculation and calibrate. Let's learn what those parameters are. Okay. Now, so that would be model calibration. You know, find a posterior distribution on true x. Okay. But it's a model. The cosmologists don't particularly think there's a unique true value. It's a model. Okay. So even the notion there is a unique true value is complicated. Secondly, there may be no choices. And what calibration means if there are no choices is obscure. Thirdly, and more practically, the full probabilistic calibration would be very hard. The likelihood is terrible. Everything is confounded. It's many-ridged. It will be a bad problem. It will be very non-robust. Small changes in our beliefs, big changes in our answers. So what we do, and I strongly recommend this as a, a word for you to think about, is something called history matching. In history matching, we don't <coughs> try to choose the best choice. We just say which choices of inputs give you output which is sufficiently close to the, to, to the things that we see in the world that it's, uh, the, the model could be said to explain at that choice of parameters what we see in the world. It doesn't mean it's true, it just means there's a consistency between the model and the world for that choice. Are there lots of choices which make it consistent? Are there no choices? And if there are many choices that make it consistent, then, for example, if you want to predict if I'm fitting a climate model, if there are many choices that match current uh, climate, do they tend to all go the same way as you, as you change things like you put CO2 in, or are there many different paths in the future? Okay. <coughs> So what we do is we have, rather than saying we see Z, we want to find X, we want to solve the inverse sort of calibration problem, we say we want to choose the X's such that Z minus F of X is sufficiently small. We don't see F of X, of course. We often we have, to, we have an emulator, so we're going to compare Z with the expected value of the function, and then we're going to ask, in fact, the actual question we ask is how many standard deviations are there apart? Because when we compare the expectation of the function to Z, we have emulator uncertainty, we have structural discrepancy, and then we have measurement error. So we expect there not to be a perfect match. Then is the difference between Z and the expected value of f of x, how many standard deviations apart are they? And if there are many standard deviations apart, we say, well, it's implausible that that would be a good choice of x. Okay? So we have what's called implausibility measures, the number of standard deviations between the expected value of the function and what we observe. And we roam around input space, finding all the x's which are, uh, 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 if it's very implausible, we rule them out. If it's not, we keep them in, and we explore like this. Okay? So we either do it individually on individual <coughs> outputs, we do it multivariately on many, we do like a Malinobis distance kind of calculation, or we take them individually and then we take the maximum. So we have many choices. Okay? What we do is we take out, we, 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 we look at certain things to match, we then cut out space from all the things, that, that all the input parameters that don't match, we then 
resample the, 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 the small space that we have, we rebuild our emulators, okay, we then match again, we cut out more space, we then resample, possibly bringing in more targets, and we refocus, and we keep refocusing until we've really narrowed in and we're getting good fits. So this is, you, you may think of this as an iterative global search strategy aimed at finding not the best X star, but all choices of X star which give reasonable matches. It, to me, it's the right way to start exploring a model. Okay? So what happens here? So in, when we did it for the universe model, so the implausibility calculation requires the emulator, the measurement, and the structural uncertainties, all of which we assess. So, so these are uncertainties like, for example, the uncertainty that we don't know the model requires all of the uh, uh, notion about where dark matter is everywhere in space and time. We don't know that. It's an uncertainty. We have to quantify that. Okay. So we did it in four waves. We, we, we did it. We emulated, cut out space, emulated, cut out space, emulated, cut out space four times. On the fifth time, we were getting the good matches and we stopped. Okay. So there we see uh, our statements. We see the number of active variables that we're identifying increasing. We see the space remaining getting smaller and smaller. We get down to about 0.1% of the original space. Very hard to find by a direct MCMC. It's a tiny fraction of the space, but you see that, uh, that by uh, iterative history matching, we can find this. Okay? It's a, and they were very happy because they, they hadn't been able to match before. Not surprisingly, you know, it's a hard thing. And there are matches, we gave them many matches so they could then find which one of the ones matched other things as well. Okay? Now, oh, let me skip over there. Those are pictures. Okay, I'm the time. Okay. So, may I can quickly say how do we do this because it raises an interesting topic all by itself. Ah. <coughs> okay, so this notion about the fact that we do not know the dark matter in the universe. Okay. So what we do have is we have a series of exchangeable computer models with different, we got, uh, 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 the, the, the big experiment at the first gave us a series of exchangeable sets of dark matter configurations in the universe. So I'm going to go very quickly through this just because it, you know, it, uh, it raises an important point. So we have not one model, we have 520 exchangeable models. We can use a De Frenetti exchangeability representation for computer models to say that, that each function has a mean function plus uh, uh, to the Fanetti theorems you have an exchangeable system there's an underlying mean and there's independent or uncorrelated residuals we have independent we have, we have our, all our exchangeable models have a, a, a core model which is the, the underlying mean plus individual residuals that comes out of the exchangeability representation we then model each one of these, and then we then build up our... It's a hierarchic model for exchangeability, okay? So these things are exchangeable. We build up an exchangeability. All I need to get you to is this point, okay? When we run our model, okay, we, we can then write down an exchange... From our exchangeability representation, if we think our universe is exchangeable with the universes in there, because we have our own dark matter configuration, okay? We can write down an <coughs> emulator for our function, if we really ran it in our universe when we added true dark matter. Okay? So this is the notion that effectively that, that uh, uh, there are many things you don't know. Emulation isn't just to emulate your function, it's to emulate the function that you cannot run, but which is the one that you would like to run. Okay? So this is an emulation for the, for the emulator, for the function run in our universe. And it raises the key point that I only did this partly because it's just interesting, but partly because uh, there's a fundamental question. We have a model. It's just a model. What does a model tell us about the real world? Okay. My view on this is that models are informative about the world because what models tell you is something about how the properties of the system influence the behavior of the system. Okay. They don't get it completely right, but they give you some information. Okay. So, and if we have a whole collection of models then that collection is giving you all sorts of different information about the relation between models, between properties and behavior. That's what models do. Okay? It's not that a model at the right value is right. It's not that the model at the right value is right added a bit of noise. The model has told you about how properties influence behavior. 
So, okay? So therefore, the right way to think about this is I have my model. My model tells me about... Uh, so, so we introduce this notion of... Oh, let my voice flip past too fast. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this is what uh, I call reification. So reify is an English word. I'm not sure it's a French word as well. To reify is to treat an abstract concept, a model, as if it was real. It says something about the real world. Okay. And this... Uh, structure tells you how to do it effectively. So this is the picture that I work on. I run a function that tells me about the reified function. Now if I now combine, so the real world, the X star, combines not with the function but with the reified function. Okay? And so this is my inferential structure. And it's no harder to work with, it's harder to think about because you have to do science, but it's no harder to analyze than the models that people use where they put the X star into the F. But the reason I don't calibrate is because it's the wrong problem. And as I showed you very quickly, you know, it is possible to create these things and it is always worthwhile to do that. Okay, enough about that. Okay. Our last topic, and I'm running out of time, so let me do this very quickly. Okay. So oil reservoirs. An oil reservoir okay, is a structure. It, uh, so an oil reservoir, underground region of rock containing oil or gas. So the hydrocarbons are trapped. There's impermeability rock on top and water underneath. And then you pump it out and do stuff. Okay. So a reservoir simulator models that process. It uses Darcy's laws for fluid flow and etc. It models what happens in a reservoir. Okay. So each cell in a reservoir is a description of its properties, its permeability, porosity, faults, etc. Okay, and so the model takes inputs, the geology of the reservoir, and it gives us outputs, the behavior of the well at the wells. Okay, so the outputs would be the, the pressures at the well, the sort the oil, the gas when the water starts breaking through, things like that. Okay, so again, people who manage reservoirs, it's a very complicated thing and hard to know how to do it. You start by building a reservoir model, a reservoir simulator. Okay. And then you history match it. You find geology descriptions that make so, sort of what's happened at the wells in your well records to now look like what you've actually seen. Okay. And that's history matching. That's quite a complicated thing. Now, we've been involved in history matching a long time, and one of my reasons for being actually liking this methodology is so that we wrote... Uh, our first experiences were on oil reservoirs, so we wrote the inference engine for a, 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 a software product called Enable, which is, which is used a lot in the oil industry. So we see people, and we still consult on this, and so we see uh, uh, basically that the methodology being used widely and working in a quite a stable way. You know, even though it was written like many years ago, it's still up there and, uh, and doing a good job. Okay, so here's the kind of example that, we, that, we, that, that our people who sell the product quote. Here's an oil field with 650 wells, a million grid cells, and the people have been trying to history match it by hand, so Enable, with 32 runs, basically found a pretty good fit. Okay, that's quite impressive, I think. I'm not sure how much I believe that, but that's the kind of uh, uh, problems we're looking at. Let me quickly run through a very simple version. Well, it was, it's simple, but it is an actual well. So, so this is a real reservoir, but it's, it's a smaller scale. There's 43 production and 13 injection wells. There's various inputs into the simulator. The outputs are the history of, the, of oil production. Okay. So the model is expensive. So in order to build our emulator, we coarsen it. So uh, we can do a thousand runs of our coarse simulator. Okay, so we use something called principal variable screening, which is different from principal components. If you wanted to uh, uh, Google principal variables, it's a powerful screening method for choosing what to emulate, what to match on. Okay? So we choose some of the outputs to match on. We build all that stuff up there is, is reminding you of what we said before. We build emulators on the course models, okay? and then we link them to the, to, to, to the emulators on, 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 on the full model. And we see there some of the outputs. These are particular oil production at particular times. And we see that the, uh, uh, the accurate simulator, or the simulator on the accurate well, is making good use of the, uh, uh, the simulator on the fast. It, you know, our method is working. Okay, so we do uh, a history match. 
And in fact, we find a, in this example a single parameter, which if we truncate on it, cuts out 90% of the space and cuts out most of the in, uh, infeasible runs. So what we're then going to do is we put some more runs in, so we re-emulate, and because it's an illustration, we're now going to show you a bit about how forecasting works. Okay. So what we want to do, so we've emulated up to now, we want to forecast one year ahead. We actually do have an observation here, so we can reality check this. We haven't used it in our calculations, but we'll, we'll use it to check. Okay. So how do we do a forecast in Bayes' linear world? It is actually quite easy. So output in the future, the y is uh, the function, at, uh, if you like, at x star plus an error. So we just need to put out a, a covariance structure on the relation between y in the future and z, what we've seen in the past. So <coughs> we therefore need to get a, 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 an uncertainty for our function evaluated at its appropriate value x star. Okay. So we can do that from our emulator. So we've now got our expected value for the function at its appropriate value and the variance at the appropriate value. And now we have a covariance structure over everything. So we have uh, y is just f star within the emulator, within, within the simulator plus epsilon, and z is y plus error. So we now have means variances and covariances for everything. We can do a, a simple base linear update of the future given the past. Very quick. And it's so quick that you can do it many, many times. If I'm doing a design problem, there are many different things I need to try out. Should I do this? Should I do that? Should I do that? Everything is quick. And if I want to reify and do that more complicated thing, everything is still quick. I can, do, I can optimize. These are fast calculations for optimization. So let me show you uh, just what happened in that example. Uh, in this picture here, the green is the data. The central line is what was actually observed with the uncertainty bounds around it. The blues are all the runs of our course simulator. The reds are all the runs of our fine simulator. The black dots are what we would forecast for what really happened, what, what we expected to happen in the future. Uh, if you look at the last one, you know, just from running our, 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 our full simulator, and then the thing you can see with a hollow dot and, and, and a gap is our forecast taking into account everything. And the main message of this is that the, uh, the, what we do moves our forecasts from where the simulator says they are towards the data because it's modeled the discrepancy as well. Okay. Oh, let me... Time is running out. So this is meant to be a picture that shows you how everything holds together. Well, let me just run it through very... You can read... It's like a cartoon. You can read it. Okay. So gradually, how do all the pieces fit together? There they are all coming up together. We, we, we start with a, a series of runs, we, we extract a reified form, we put the real reality in, we run a multi-model ensemble off it, we introduce a fast version, we introduce a fast version with decisions in it, we link things up. You know. These are the kind of pictures that we, we should be working with. Okay? So that uh, uh, an uncertainty analysis, every one of those links involves a particular thing that I, I just pointed to in, in, in the... Uh, 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 the illustrations, and there's a big picture of how all the different functions, and there could be many more functions happening here, linked together. Okay? One person can't do this. This is for teams. One person can't build a climate simulator. One person can't build a reservoir simulator. One person can't do an uncertainty analysis. It's a team, and, and uh, the, the, the graphical structuring tells you how to divide things. So, let me get concluding comments. There is a general methodology for performing full uncertainty analysis on complex physical systems, such as galaxies, climate oil reservoirs, which are modeled by computer simulators. There is a methodology. We can do it. Now, however, there's a very sh great shortage of statisticians who are doing this. Okay? And uh, partly it's because scientists and decision makers don't realize that they need these people Partly it's because statisticians don't realize the depth in which they should get embedded in these things, so they get sidetracked. Well, they do an important part. It's the data, or it's this, or it's that. Okay? So most analyses are either tentative, oh, it's full of assumptions, or overconfident, oh, this is fine. Okay? Okay. So they not pro we, we need to do proper uncertainty analyses. There aren't enough statisticians. There aren't enough resources. We could change that. And finally, what should you actually do so multivariate, multi-level, multi-model emulation. 
careful structural discrepancy modeling, iterative history matching, and Bayes' linear forecasting is a great first pass that you can actually do, which would be a great way to treat complicated models. I finally just got some, uh, some references, two pages of references. Firstly, for the applications. If you want to read about the reservoirs, here was our first paper we did a long time ago that set up how you do the reservoirs. The example that I talked about is in this second one. There's the, the reference for the galaxy. We do that in great detail. We really show you how to history match. There's a big discussion about it. The climate application, including the geometric tricks that we use. There it is. Some more general references. As I said, I'm a subjectivist. The first paper there is, these are my principles. Okay, I, I lay them out. Uh, Jim Berger laid out his objective Bayesian principles. We argue and there's a discussion. This whole notion of reifying, taking a model and making it like more real. There's a paper that describes that. This Bayes linear thing, there is a book, yes. A lot of blood in that. There's, my, there's our book. Finally, uh, just because, I mean, I've given you my view, of course, there is a standard Bayesian view which is full of good things as well, and a great place to start is Kennedy and O'Hagan and the Design and Analysis of Computer Experiments. It's a great book for emulation, not so good on, on discrepancy, but it's a good place to start as well. Fine, thank you very much. I think the applications are terrific, and I really like the the way we approach them. What I'm not so sure about is whether the philosophy is actually necessary for them. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, a, a lot of the analysis is essentially standard linear analysis, you know, implicitly if you want from a Bayesian point, assuming that everything in sight is Gaussian or jointly Gaussian or something like that. And uh, I, I would expect that you probably, if at the end of one of these analyses, were asked to trace the development of your beliefs, even to define what a belief means, which is something that we haven't gotten to. <laughs> uh, it, may, it might not be so easy. On the other hand, the fact that in the end you get pictures which make sense to the people who are actually interested in these questions, I think that's, that's terrific. I'm just not so sure that you can't get into that by, you know, more standard approach of, of you know, going back and forth in calibration, leaving things out, and, 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 and looking at it. But that's... My question is about the, the prior information mm -hmm. and uh, how to ask, how you, do you assess the relevance of your prior information because sometimes you are not sure that your prior is, it is a, another possibility of insanity, you know, a, a, bad, a bad prior. And so what, how do you assess the... So those are two kind of linked questions. Do we need all the Bayesian, the subjectivist Bayesian and the philosophy? And uh, obviously anything you can do really well, you can do almost as well, okay? And uh, that's fine. You can do something where, uh, uh, but it's still up to you if you don't want to do a, a, a subjectivist Bayesian thing to say exactly what you mean, why you mean it, what you, you know, what you took to be true in order to your analysis to have validity. You haven't escaped by doing traditional statistics. You have, to me, you have a harder job. I mean, it will be interesting the extent to which you can do it. But as I said, so you asked me about the prior, okay? So you cannot do this without the knowledgeable scientists. So the reservoir engineers we work with, they have spent their lives working on reservoirs. They work with geomodelers who have already done very complicated geomodeling exercises. The cosmologists, that's their life as well. Okay. To extent, this is why we do careful diagnostics, because anything that we do where, which contradicts what they thought, that's to them the most interesting thing. If we could show them that their judgments were bad, you know, and their judgments were meant to summarize the current state of knowledge of physics, they're very happy. Because that means that there's more excitement, you know, that anything, you know, in a, we did find the fits and they were happy with that. 
they would have been happier if we could have shown them that they couldn't fit or if what they thought to be true wasn't right. So the, the diagnostic section, I would have these little lines do diagnostics. Okay? But that's why whenever we, for example, we emulate, we then uh, uh, we check by seeing what would happen if we leave points out, whether we can, we, we can reproduce. Why we're very careful about looking at our matches to, to what we see in the world. And even then, yes, there are judgments and the Bayes linear setup is meant, because it's simple enough, to allow you to vary those judgments and see the impact that the varying of the judgments can have on your conclusions and therefore whether, I mean, because what's so important really isn't your judgment or your judgment or your judgment, but it's, the, if you like, the collective judgments of the scientific community. And you might think there's a better way of doing it, but uh, I, if you're trying to forecast like what will happen to climate in a hundred years, you need to put in a whole bunch of judgments while making it clear that they are judgments. And there is no other way to do it. Okay. So I'm sorry there's no time left for, for other questions. Uh, thank you again, Michael, for coming and thank you for this talk. And I may suggest you uh, to, to stay in, in, this, uh, in this room because there will be a session about computer experiments, so it's a strictly uh, related topic.